So do you use a lot of what, you know, you were talking about earlier, you do a lot of intervallic stuff. How do you approach that stuff? And what are you thinking about? I mean, I wish I, I wish I knew. <laughs> okay. So, but I mean, you, you obviously knew the analysis of that lick. So yeah, you, do you, do you think about that? Do you, do you have a certain methodology you use or a certain approach to developing licks like that? I mean, I, I don't think I, I, I don't really play those kinds of licks. I mean, I do some stretchy stuff. It's really, it's really hard to analyze yourself on the spot like this. You can think, I, I personally will think about some things as single string triads. Um, that's why when you said it went to B I, and you did the half step, I just thought of it as a minor six from B, not as related oh, yeah. to A, right? So, you know, so for me, I might take, like if you're just in a diatonic key, if you're, let's say, E minor, for example, if you're playing across the six, uh, each string at the 12th fret, then you got E minor, A minor, D major, G major, B minor, and, and E minor again. So I might think about, I would think about each string as its own triad, you know, mm -hmm. but of course you, you certainly an, analyze it as what each one of those notes are in relationship to the root. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, and that, that's like, how I usually think of, of things. Sure. You know, I always relate it to the root of wherever right. now, I'm so, at. In some situations, the chord changes are coming by so quick. It's, it's, if it's diatonically, if it's still diatonic, the changes are coming by so quick that it's, you know, I'm not necessarily thinking about how each note is affecting that particular chord of that in that ex you know, instance. Mm -hmm. So I'll still go back to like thinking about, you know, just, you know, it's uh, each one's its individual. Mm -hmm. You know, just individual triads or I'll take that and I'll add another finger to it and do like, you know, if it's minor. <laughs> you know, in major. So for minor, I'll add the four. And for major, I'll add two. So you can get, you know, different, you know, interesting sounds that way. Um, certainly when you, when you go into sweeping, um, there's a lot of different extensions you can get off that too, you know, because if, if you do something like, um, you know, something like that. You know, each one of those would be as it relates to a dominant seventh chord. You know, you got the flat seven, one, three, five, you got the three, five, seven, nine, eleven, etc. things like that. Um, so just, I think for me personally, it just depends on what I'm playing over as to how I think about it. If I'm going to analyze it as compared to one chord or, you know, as the chords passing by, you know, it's just a lot of different ways you can approach it. Mm -hmm. How do you, gen you generally think about it always as per chord? Yeah, I, I do that quite a bit. Yeah. I mean, obviously, also like if if the if the chords move, but you, it's diatonic, so you, you can still you know be in one position. Right. It's like I I'm all also aware of you know the relationship sure. from the like the key, the root of, right. of the key. You know. Sure, absolutely. But I, I guess that that's one thing coming from a like a bit of jazz schooling, mm -hmm. where where you really have to be on top of the chords, you know, because the chord changes. So, so right. it's, it's like, it's not just diatonic in one right. key. Yeah, absolutely. In that situation, you have to think about it per chord. So one of my favorite solos from you, like I said earlier, was the Neuromancers. And it seems like in that solo, you, you change keys, or at least you change kind of the, the whole feel of that at least three times, maybe four. Like, do you just do you just break down the solo into each individual part and then piece it together, or how, how did you approach that? Let's say. Uh, well, generally, when I record a solo, I usually I just start recording and and I I jam on it and mm -hmm. maybe I record a bit and maybe I have like a few bars that are improvised and then something happens and then maybe I want to write you know something that leads to the next part mm -hmm. or whatever it, it's rarely you know improvised in one take mm -hmm. uh, well right yeah because i actually i have to explain that to my students because they think that you know when they're writing a solo you have to write all 30 seconds or 45 seconds on the spot and if it's not good you suck and i'm like no that's not how it works like 
you know, you improvise, you get some ideas and then you go, Hey, I like this part, but I didn't like this. So how do I lead into this good part? You know what I mean? It's a process and it's an art. And that's, you know, I think that that's something that I think people overlook a lot. I've had some pretty lucky moments <laughs> in the past, you know, where you get some good takes. I've, I've had situations where you go in the studio and you have something planned out, this whole grand thing, you got the solo all worked out and you get in the studio and it doesn't work. And it's like, mm-hmm. okay, well, let me just try something else. And then it ends up just happening on this, on the spot and, you know, and you get lucky. Um, but even still with that, you're yeah. still at least playing over the song multiple times and getting ideas out there rather sure. than you do it. It's the first time you've heard the track, the first time you heard the, the, the solo section and you just came up with the world's greatest solo. I feel like yeah. putting that pressure on yourself. Well, isn't, well, the world's greatest solo, I don't know about any of that shit, but you know, um, but that's what I'm saying. Things that I can live with. That. Yeah. But yeah, you have I students mean, that think that, you know, because they hit a wrong note that that's, that's something bad. I think that, yeah. uh, you know, you gotta be a little more forgiving mm-hmm. where I wasn't allowed to hear the track before I got there. And I had to go in and just do it on the fly. Um, you know, this one band that I did some guest solos on their album, um, they weren't even supposed to be in the studio. It was all hush hush. They flew me down uh, to Florida to record it. And, and the only chance I got to hear the track in advance was the day I got there. They let me come in the studio and listen to it. And then I went back to my hotel room and I had to, based on what I heard in that moment, I had to try to formulate some ideas that night to go back in the studio and record the next day. Um, it was interesting. I. I snuck a recording on my cell phone while I was standing there. So I had something to listen to when I was back at the room, <laughs> you know, but, but uh, that was definitely interesting, but it ended up coming out. Well, it was, it wasn't super challenging stuff. And it's, it's really interesting. Some of the things that, you, that, that sound like they would be easy. And then you go try to play over them and it's not and, and vice versa. Uh, have you ever experienced a situation where somebody's saying it's going to play over and it's like, sounds like this, well, this is going to be pretty easy. And then you try to play over it and it's like, it just doesn't work out to be that easy. And, and in those situations, if you have encountered that, how do you approach getting through it? I mean, I, I do quite a bit of guest solos. And a lot of time times it's it's just a bad boy riff, mm-hmm. you know, something that would imply it being, you know, dominant Phrygian or something. Right. When, when it's like... Something. Right, right. You know. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Not, I'm, gonna have to, I'm gonna use that term. I'm stealing that bad boy riff. Yeah, awesome. and and when that happens, that's that's for me. That just that's pretty makes easy. me feel really unexcited. Oh yeah, yeah. And, but it's, and, but it's and most it's of the not, times I get that. Yeah. Now, so what I do is oftentimes I I re- record some some keyboard pads on top, mm-hmm. and I make up a chord progression on top. So if if I have something like that, that I might do something like. And then I have some movement. Right. So instead of just you know, shred, shred, right. shredding in that one mm-hmm. key center, I, I can move around, you know? Yeah. It's very interesting that you, you do that because I, uh, I encountered something just like that. My singer um, in, in Dave Reckoning owns his own re- recording studio and, and does a lot of recording. And he's also a guitar player as well as a singer. And he was helping me. Uh, he was recording me doing some guest solos for, for some, a couple of artists and, and I encountered that where it was like, it just seemed like it was very static and the chord changes weren't going anywhere. And I couldn't find anything that I liked. And he was like, well, try, try putting a melody over it and then follow the melody to create the solo against, you know, and it's kind yeah. of like the same thing that you, you're talking about where you use keyboards to create a patch, you know, some chord changing, some movement in there. And it, you know, was, and I'd never really thought about that before. I just was kept banging my head against the wall, trying to figure out something to do that was was interesting you know yeah. I mean? That's, that's and i mean when i cool. when i send the solo back i i include the uh, a track w- with the the synth mm-hmm. but it's like up to the up to the band or or the guys you know if, if they want to use it right. because even if you remove it you're still gonna have you know that it starts you know on the I mean, you right. could hear that there was some movement, you know, harmon- right. harmonic movement. So even yeah. if you remove the chords, it's still there. Right. Yeah, that's that's awesome. It's kind of like um... something. Speaking of that Neuromancer solo, uh, since in my band, I, I get to write all the, you know, solo parts and, and, and like the, the, the chord progressions. And then I, I try to set things up so, so that I get some 
interesting spots where I, where mm-hmm. I can do some things that would twist my ear. Right. And mm-hmm. and that's and that solo it modulates through four keys. Mm-hmm. And the last second to last modulation it it goes from A flat minor to G minor. Mm-hmm. But the chord progression is So, so it's a one flat six uh, four f- five chord mm-hmm. progression, and right. then it's the same chord progression but in G. So obviously, the, for the first three chords, I, I play diatonically in in A flat. reach the five chord uh, I mean the way I thought about this it's your since I've I'm uh, played the other chords before you hear this as being the five chord and mm-hmm. you want to go back to the one right right but instead of playing the appropriate uh, notes to go back to the one I start playing Lydian like instead of Phrygian dominant I start mm-hmm. playing Lydian <laughs> And then it's like, you know, that's that exactly. doesn't sound right. Mm-hmm. But those notes are the same notes as you know G minor. Mm-hmm. So so that like makes it lead into the next chord. So right. mm-hmm. I, I used the, the notes in my in my solo to to modulate. Right. Yeah. I used it. That, that's awesome. Man. And that's what that's what like you said where it like where you're trying to write something that turns your own ear. You know, it makes you kind yeah. of go like, oh, what was that? And that's what turned me on to that solo when I heard it. Because, you know, again, it's not just staying diatonic the whole time, running through scales and then running up scales. You know what I mean? And I heard that and I was yeah. like, oh, my gosh, how did he do that? And then I had to learn it and be like, OK, so right here, he you hit that Lydian. And at the time, I didn't know that it was Lydian. But uh, but like I, I played it and I was like, I would never hit that note but it makes so much sense because it pushes you right back here to that G minor. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, you have to be aware of those things sometimes. And it's really Because as a, as a listener, when you hear that, you can feel like, oh, like you start leaning, like what's mm-hmm. happening? Yeah. And then and it comes home. If, if I would go back to a, a flat minor, it would be like, then you lose your balance. But since you start leaning and then you land on the right spot and it's like. Right. Yeah. And it feels really jarring too, but in a good way. Like, you're like, where is he going with this? Like, you feel lost for a second, and then you bring it back home, and you're like, oh, that was really smart, actually. Yeah. And that's why I love love that that whole solo. It's the, it's the whole thing with, with the, having that the, the tension and the release. Mm-hmm. I talk about that a lot, you know, with, with, with writing solos and stuff, too. Like, essentially what you're doing is you're just building up moments of tension and then resolving them however you can to whatever you know because we're talking a lot about secondary dominance and stuff you know building that tension mm. in there too non-diatonically and to solo over that is so much more interesting in my opinion you know